especially the English Bible, is divided up into books, the chapters, and verses. And they are extremely helpful, but they're not always divided in exactly the right place. And they don't always have the best names. For instance, <coughs> we have a set of books incorporated into the Bible called the prophetic books. The Torah, the, the scriptures, pardon me, is usually divided into the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. And you've got Daniel in the writings when Daniel is very clearly a prophet. And then we have some books that are called minor prophets. Well, in the American Western mentality, if it's a minor prophet and you have major prophets, let's study the major prophets and the minor prophets, they're just minor and we don't need to fool with that. So then you have major holy days and you have minor holy days. So let's learn the holy days, let's learn the feasts, let's learn the festivals, let's learn the special seven. But as far as those minor holy days, we'll, we'll come back to that. So in, in that mentality, Hanukkah and Purim get put on the back burner. There's no such thing as minor holy days doctrinally. They're minor because they lack the same amount, the absorbent amount of scripture that we have in the major prophets. So it's the size of the book, major, minor. It's not the doctrine that's in the book. Purim is known as one of the minor holy days, although it is incredibly, that they're all important, don't misunderstand me, but it's like saying the favorite book of the Bible, the favorite book of the Bible is the one you're reading at the time. Uh, they're all important, incredibly important, but it's one of those that really explain in its own way, what God is doing and why God is doing it, even though the name of God is never in this book. So, we're going to look at the Messiah as he's presented in Purim, and we're going to go through a little bit of history, a little bit of uh, Old Testament or First Covenant, and a little bit of uh, apostolic writings. Moses, uh, Esther, Moses, Esther is based, uh, uh, Purim is based in the book of Esther. The book of Esther is one of the books in the scriptures that's called a Megillah. A Megillah means the whole thing. Uh, in, in, in the language of the Hebrew people in Yiddish, it's Gunther Magilla. The, the, it's, there was even a cartoon years ago about a gorilla, and it was so <coughs> they big, they named him Magilla. But uh, it, 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 the, the, the thing is, with the Magillas, and there's five of them, this tradition to read the whole thing. It's tradition. To read the whole thing publicly. That started because most synagogue attendees don't read anything. So they listen when the when the parsha is read from the bema, but they don't go home like we do with the Bible and read. And so the reading of a Megillah came about in order for people to hear the whole book. Now that's an elementary perspective 
think there are, I'm sure there are other reasons, but that's the broader general perspective. Now I want to look at just a few verses. We're not going to commentate on them because I've got a whole teaching on them, but I wanted you to look at Esther 9, 117 and 22. These are dates. On the twelfth day of the month, which month? You see, you, here's what I, I taught years ago, and here's what you got to understand. The calendar <coughs> that you use every day in Montgomery, Alabama, is not a Bible calendar. In fact, the Gregorian calendar was invented and put into place by Pope Gregory to keep you from knowing your Bible. Deliberate, malicious. So you've got to understand, you've got to live by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, January, February, uh, March, April, May, June, July. you got to live by that, but, but you got to know and study the Hebrew months. In the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, on the day that the enemies of Yehudim were expected to prevail over them, it was turned about that the Yehudim prevailed over their adversaries. This is like this particular Purim in this particular year, in this particular this is like reading the newspaper. This is like watching TV, watching the news. This is like hearing the news however you receive it. This is what's going on. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there's a Haman in every generation. And but we'll get to him in a few minutes. And they gained relief on the 14th day, making it a day of feasting and gladness. Esther 9, 17. Mordecai instructed them to observe them as days of fasting and gladness and sending delicacies to one another. Ooh, good fruit, nice delicacies, good job. And gifts to the poor. If you want to find a place in the scriptures where believers are shown to give gifts to one another, here it is. Uh, I lost my chance to talk for a minute. I had something really important to say about the gifts, and the Lord didn't want me to say it, so. <coughs> In the biblical book of Esther, We've got some heroes. We've got some heroines. It's a story based around people. Let me begin by telling you that in my opinion, Mordecai and the other leaderships of the Hebrew people were out of the will of God, staying in Babylon and not following the prophets to Jerusalem to rebuild the city the streets and to to follow through with the decree of Artaxerxes that he gave in 445 BC they had it too good in the land and they were outside of God's will by staying in the land but that doesn't mean that God didn't still deal with them he did Babylon where this took place was at the time the largest population of Jewish people in the world. They'd been completely, well, now, I don't be careful with that word. They were majority driven out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, out of their land. They were taken captive. We know they were captive. We know how they were forced to worship. We don't need to rehearse all that, <clears throat> but they're in the land about it. Daniel was a high-ranking executive in the Babylonian kingdom, predominantly over the Hebrew people. 
So the largest population in the world at this time of Hebrew people was in Babylon. This, uh, from the east. The story of Purim is told in the biblical book of Esther. Now let's look at the heroes and the, and the heroines. We have Esther. We have Mordecai. Mordecai is a very common Jewish name today among the Orthodox. Morty, Mordecai. Uh, and we have Ahasuerus. Both people would use Ahasuerus if they could say it. Uh, <clears throat> he's king of Persia. Now we have the Medo-Persian Empire, which incorporates what was the Babylonian Empire. So it's easier just to say the Babylonian Empire because at one time they were all one. <clears throat> king of Esther, Esther, something could say it. Loved Esther more than any other woman and made Esther his queen. Now, just uh, to give you the story, Ahasuerus had a drunken party. Uh, 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 literally what you and I would call an orgy. Uh, food, drugs of that day, alcohol, and sex. And he sent for his wife, Vashti, in order to bring her to parade her naked in front of this orgy. And she said no. I'm sure she said it a little stronger than that. But she said, no, I won't do it. So he banished her. He could have killed her. I mean, he could have killed anybody he wanted to. But he banished Vashti. So then he began a contest for a new wife. Now, they're living in a palace. They're living in big, beautiful buildings, but they still have the mentality of the desert people. Uh, how many wives can you get into one tent? It's called a harem. Har how many? So, it doesn't mean that she was the only wife. It just meant that she was the wife in favor at the time. King Hesuerus had a secretary of state, I guess we would call it, named Haman. And we described Haman as an arrogant, egotistical advisor to the king who hated Mordecai. Now just before I go on too far, just let me uh, summarize why Haman hated Mordecai. What was it that Satan wanted, regardless of where the fall took place? What was it that Hasatan, what was it that the evil one, what was it that that archangel wanted? It's specifically written down in Isaiah 14. I shall put my throne above the Most High God. He wanted to be worshipped. And this is, the, this is the mark of a cult. This is the mark of an insane person that's trying to use religion to control people that they want to be worshipped. They can do no wrong. You've got to sow your seed. You've got to give your money. You've got to do whatever you have to do <coughs> in order to pay them homage. And Haman had that attitude. Haman could come to the 21st century and be a very successful televangelist. He wanted to be worshipped. And he got word from spies, from tattletales, that this Mordecai didn't bow down when the instructions were given for everyone to bow down to this Haman. In a speech that is all too familiar, Haman told the king, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your realm. 
Now watch this. This is profound. Their laws are different from those of every other people. What a 150% true statement. The laws of Torah outshine, outdo the laws of anybody, anywhere. Right now, they are, there's legislation about who can use what bathroom and, and what, what, what uh, pronouns you can use and call. Listen, family, you cannot delegate righteousness. You can pass all the laws, all the books, all the things you want to. You cannot delegate righteousness. Their laws are not our laws. Now, we're commanded, Romans chapter 12, we're commanded to be under the laws of those that are in authority until they contradict the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of the true and living God. Then we've got an issue. Their laws are different from your laws. Their laws are different from those of other people's. And they do not observe the king's laws. Therefore, is it not befitting for the king to not tolerate them? The king gave the faith of the Jewish people to Haman to do as he pleased to them. And Haman planned. Here it is. Every generation, every generation, Haman planned to exterminate all of the Hebrews, the Greeks the Babylonians, Haman, Mussolini, Hitler, ISIS. It's all the same. It's all. The situation in Israel today is not, listen to me, is not about land. It has nothing to do with who has what land. There can never be a two-state solution because their understanding is that they want to be Judenstadt, they want to be Jew free. <coughs> <coughs> they don't, excuse me, <coughs> they don't, come on, <coughs> they don't want to tolerate any Hebrews. <coughs> and the way to do that, <coughs> I almost set that alarm up. The way to do that is to toler not tolerate. Wait a minute, I can't talk. <coughs> I'll be back. I got a lot to talk about. <laughs> <coughs> so, to exterminate the Jews. Mordecai, now when, I, I'm going to back up to Mordecai being a cousin. These titles, these familiar titles are not thank you man how many proof is it 85 <laughs> do you want a cough drop to have any I think that helped the water yeah okay. <clears throat> too bad it will <laughs> <clears throat> an uncle could be a brother an uncle could be an adopted father, which is what I think it was. Uh, an uncle, a cousin, a brother. They have different meanings at different times in different circumstances and situations. So, in the English translators, they refer to Mordecai as Esther's uncle. I believe it was her stepfather. But the, 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 <clears throat> the title and relationship would be the same. Mordecai persuaded Esther to speak to the king. Now, <clears throat> Esther won the contest. She was taken in. There was a beauty contest. Uh, <clears throat> they were soaked in oil. They were rubbed down with roses. They did uh, their nose. They did their toes. They did their fingernails. They did everything you were supposed to do. And she won the contest. So she became queen. Although the queen couldn't speak to the king unless he spoke to her first. 
he spoke to her or anyone first by extending a scepter. <coughs> Mordecai persuaded Esther to speak to the king on behalf of the Jewish people. Now, Mordecai had told Esther, you keep your ethnicity to yourself, inside, outside. You, your ethnicity shouldn't be a part of this. You keep your ethnicity to yourself because Haman has decreed that all the Jews should be destroyed. <clears throat> and because you're Jewish, you've reached a place that God has put you and you need to keep it to yourself. Because anyone who came into the king's presence without being summoned could be put to death. And at this point, she'd not been summoned. Esther went in to the king to prepare herself for three days. Now, class, I cannot get over and say enough about three. The, the study of biblical numerology, and listen, when you do get around to studying biblical numerology, there are only seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, twenty-one, thirty-six. All of those are completely made up. There's only seven. The reason is not an eight when it talks about the eighth day. It's talking about the next day or the renewing, the rebuilding of the week. <clears throat> so biblical numerology is important. But the three... Well, I started to say the three is so important. No, they're all important. Four, the judgment. Five, the grace. Six is man. Seven is completion and perfection. Eight is a new beginning. They're all important. You can see them in the menorah. <clears throat> the, king, the king welcomed her. <coughs> she explained the circumstance, the situation, and what was going on. And the Jewish people were saved, and Haman and his ten sons were hanged on the huge gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. It was somewhat interesting to me that in the execution of Saddam Hussein, after his failed attempt to destroy the Jews of the 21st century, that he was hung. It just, I don't know, it just, to me, it just seemed like appropriate. The book of Esther is the only book of scripture that does not contain the yod He vav He. It doesn't contain the word God. In fact, <clears throat> with the exception of one, one minor illusion, there is no reference to God. Mordecai makes a vague reference to the fact that the Jews will be saved by someone else if Esther does not. But that's the closest thing that we have in the book of the mention or the office work of, of the responsibility of God. This message is so important <clears throat> This message is gained from the story that God often works in ways that are not apparent. Now, did I tell you about, um, I don't know who I told what story to, the two angels that were traveling, and they came up on a very, very poor farmhouse. The house was freezing. Uh, the food was almost gone. The farmer took the two angels in. He gave them his own bedroom, which is the one that had a little bit of heat. He gave them the, all the food, the best food that he had. He watched over them. He took care of them. He put them in the, the best room. In the morning, they got up 
and his wife was dead. And the apprentice angel said to the experienced angel, what, what, what did you do? Look how good they were to us, how he gave the very best, how he gave his own room, how he gave his own food. You, you, and, and you let his wife die? And the angel said, you don't understand. Things are not always the way they seem. When death came, I messed up the whole story. Scratch that. I'll tell you. The, here was the. Let me let me fix it. The cow died, which was the only source of milk. And when the death came for the wife, he gave him the cow. I I totally blew it. But things are not always what they seem. There's much that can be gained from the book of Esther, but things are not always what they seem. God works in ways that are not our ways. He works in very, very special ways. He works in ways and times that are not our ways. <clears throat> Pur, which means lot, the casting of lot, the, the rolling of the stones, Purim is celebrated on the 14th day of Adar. Now this can get confusing. It takes a while to master the Hebrew calendar. <coughs> One of the reasons that it's so hard is people continue to try to justify the Gregorian calendar and make it work on the Hebrew calendar, when uh, when they say when is Passover this year, they want to know what day it is on the Gregorian calendar. And my answer is Passover the same time it was every year. It's 14 Nisan. It never changes year in and year out. You can't make this calendar fit this calendar. It won't work. You can use all of the calisthenics. You can use all the adaptation. You can use all the twists and turns. You can use all the little stick figures and the stick letters. You can do all that, excuse me, BS, and it won't work. You cannot make God's calendar live, work by the Pope's calendar. The Pope's calendar was created first, first, uh, The, the one we have today is a correction of the Gregorian calendar. There was one before that, the, the calendar of Pope Gregory. It won't work. It won't work. It won't work. Here, here I did, you, you, you won't have any trouble with this, but in Christian circles, I do this all the time. What, what day was Jesus crucified? That's what they ask me. Well, well on the third day, well, he rose on Thursday. What day is that? Sunday. Well, what uh, what day was he crucified? Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, we, uh, Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, all that other absolute unmitigated silliness. It's so simple. How many days in a week? Seven. How many days in the tomb? Three. Three. What day was Jesus crucified? Thursday. Fourth day. Five, six, and seven in the grave. First day of resurrection. That's all. It's the simple. You, but you can't take that Bible calendar and make it work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You can put all the ashes on your forehead you want to. It's not going to work. Pour them. was established in the city of Shushan, which is a walled city. I'm going to tell you a personal story. I'm going to get it right this time. Deliverance from the massacre came and was not complete until the next day. In Israel, 45 miles apart, you got two big, beautiful cities. 
You have Tel Aviv and you have Jerusalem. On Tel Aviv, on the 14th of Adar, you have this huge Purim celebration. Streets are closed, parades, food, music, giving of gifts. It, it, it looks like a biblical Mardi Gras celebration. I mean, it, it's, it's, all the stops are out. Jerusalem doesn't have it. 45 miles apart until the next day. Because Jerusalem is a walled city. And Jerusalem celebrates Passover. I mean, <laughs> I'm not messing up. Celebrates Purim uh, the next day when the redemption came to everybody on the 15th day. So you've got a Purim celebration in Jerusalem and a Purim celebration in Tel Aviv. Now let me tell you what Justin and I did. Justin said, let's go downtown. So we took a taxi to Ben Yehuda and Jaffa Road up on top of the hill. Jaffa Road was decked out on Purim for the whole thing. It was hilarious. We, we, we walked with the puppets. We, uh, we had a great time. And Justin said, let's go to Jerusalem. They'll do it again tomorrow. <laughs> so we got on the bus called a Sharut. It's a little bus that just goes Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. Uh, and so we got on the Sharut and we went to We didn't check in anywhere. It was too much partying going on. So we, we went through Purim two times. Not only did we celebrate Purim, we celebrated in both cities, and that's a personal memory that I, I really love. Uh, the deliverance from the massacre was not complete until the next day. The 15th day is referred to as Shushan Purim, or the Purim in the capital. <clears throat> this is confusing. It takes a while to stay with it, hold on. In biblical leap years, not Gregorian leap years, in biblical leap years, there are two months of Adar. Purim is celebrated in the second month of Adar, so that it always falls one month before the Passover. Now, how do we know when it's time to celebrate Purim? Did they have a calendar? Did they have a a, 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 a clock on the wall with a date. How did they know? One month before Passover without fail, agriculturally perfect, one month before Passover at the beginning of Purim, the almond tree blooms. When the almond tree blooms, it's time for Purim. One month later, it's Passover. <coughs> the almond branch is born again. What branch is in the Ark of the Covenant? Aaron's rod that budded, what is it? It's an almond branch. One month before Passover, regardless of the name you put on the month, that by the way, Adar is a Babylonian name, Purim is celebrated. So we always have it one month before Passover. Always on a full moon. Always on a full moon. Yes. Yeah, but I didn't go there. Uh, uh, it's a lunar calendar. So, uh, God brings the light of the reflection of the full moon on the holy day. The, the full moon and the holy days are synonymous. Uh, however, we should celebrate the holiday and not mourn or not fast. I'm, I'm sorry. And however we celebrate the holy day, the holy days, it shouldn't be one of mourning and fasting. Some communities observe Purim Katan, that is a little Purim, on the anniversary of any day when the community was saved from a catastrophe, an evil, or an oppression. Uh, in the future, 
October 7 is going to be a Purim Katan in Israel. Uh, in modern history, uh, the dates of the liberation of the concentration camps uh, in 1945 are Purim Katan. Uh, uh, a small taste of the deliverance of the Hebrew people. It's customary, and this is for the children, to boo and to hiss and to stomp their feet. And they've got little noisemakers called groggers that, that, that they'll get. Never, 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 never give the grockers to the children before the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and then, wait a minute, then the adults do it. <laughs> while you're trying to teach. And those grockers have the absolute unholy sound that destroys your attention span, which I don't have much of one to begin with. Uh, don't give them the grockers until the last possible minute. To boo, hiss, stomp your feet, and rattle the grockers whenever the name of the Haman is boo is mentioned. The purpose of this is to blot out the name of Haman, and today, at this time, among religious community, communities, and you say someone's name that's evil, they'll spit, boop, boop, make his name be blotted out. Memory, and the blotting out of memory, is two very important things in Judaism. The primogenitorship, uh, Adam, Abraham, Jacob, Esau, passing down the line, what tribe you're from, what your tribe did, what your tribe was called, the the history of the Hebrew people and the memory among the Judaism that my family's from, Ashkenazim. You name after the dead. You keep their name alive. I found a prayer book, a Siddur. And I'm going through this old Siddur. You know how people in the front of a Bible would write important dates. And I'm reading through these, these dates. This happened, this happened. And you know what I read? Benjamin died July the 28th, 1947. That's my birthday. Benjamin was on his way back from the Second World War and was killed in a plane crash on July 28, 1947. And his sister-in-law, Sarah, gave birth to a son. And they automatically named the son for the dead to keep the memory alive. The Sephardim won't do that. They name only after the living. But whichever way you do it, it's very important in the Hebrew world that you keep the name from not being blotted out. What is the one thing that only God made? Earth. Stones. So what do you go to keep the memory alive in God's plan, what do you put on the grave when you go and visit in a Jewish cemetery? You put a stone. I was here. I was here. This is God's creation. I was here, and I remember you. <clears throat> it's evolved into solar-powered lights and artificial plants and million dollar funeral it's evolved into some different stuff but it's good to remember may his name be blotted out we're not even going to remember his name now we're taught to send out gifts of food or drink 
to make gifts to charity. The sending of gifts of food and drink is referred to as portions. Sending out portions. Now go want to go back to me and Justin. We're on a military base in Israel. Spring of the year doing our spring tour, trying to get done, get out of Israel before the Passover crowd. And we're on a military base. We're getting a tour of the military base and this military chaplain, this rabbi says, Everybody in the chapel, it's time for poor. We're gonna start poor. And they read the book of Esther. They read it real fast, the whole Megillah. They read it 982 miles. No, he couldn't get anything out of it, but they read it. Then he had little bags, like you'd see at a wedding, little, not a bad, little gift with a cookie and a verse of scripture. And I gave my cookie to you and you gave your cookie to me in order to fulfill this. But really, that's not what this is for. Really, this is for giving to people who are doing ministry of what's on your heart. This is ministry giving. God protected the Hebrew people. God survived the Hebrew people. God used the Hebrew people. Now the Hebrew people are are using the message to tell people about God and we are supposed to support them to our gifts of food and drink and to make gifts to charity, to love. The sending of gifts of food and drink is referred to as portions. Now, this is where the cookie comes in. <clears throat> you know the egg on the Seder plate? I tell people how the egg got on the Seder plate. I don't know. I have no idea how this cookie got in to the pool. But somebody started making cookies, and I'm glad they started making cookies. Then they made the cookies to be in the shape of Haman's hat, whatever Haman's hat looked like. Some refer to it as Haman's ear, which make no sense, and they call them Haman Tosh, the, the Tosh, the, the Nosh, the little bit of food that looked or resembled Haman. Uh, so we have this triangular fruit-filled cookie to represent Haman's three-cornered hat. Now, customary, a custom that Purim is celebrated by plays and prodigy. Uh, pe- <laughs> parodies it's celebrated by we uh, we had a couple in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in Best Our Shalom congregation and their little pulpit presentation of, of Purim was so fantastic that we raised money to bring them from Charlotte to Florida to do this Purim presentation and nobody in South Florida has ever seen anything like it. And it, it was an absolute hit. But Purim is more than just a parody. It's just more than a play for the children. It's a special time to honor and to praise God. Now Purim is not subject to biblical or parentheses man-made Sabbath regulations. You know, you don't know much about the Sabbath. I'll tell you what you don't what you know about the Sabbath. It's once a week and you don't work. The rest of it, the candles, the wine, the bread, the rest of it, the what you don't do, don't drive a car, don't light a lamp. That's all man made. We know very little about the Sabbath. We know that there's no work, but it never tells us in the scripture what work is. Purim is not subject to the Sabbath-like restrictions that are on the other holy days. However, there are some sources that indicate that we should not go about our ordinary business, that we should set the, set the day aside as a time of respect 
and it's a time of enjoyment, enjoying what God has done for us, literally supporting those who are doing some type of ministry or uh, health uh, organizations that, that, that are reaching out to people, feeding people. Uh, that's the exchanging of gifts, not just giving a cookie wrapped up in a cloth to one another. Now, there's the introduction. And here's four. There is an unnamed feast in John chapter 5. Yeshua, the Messiah, is in Jerusalem for this feast. So-called scholars have debated whether it was Passover, Purim, Sukkot, Shavuot, one of the three major pilgrim festivals, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Now this is my sentence. I added this in all by myself as a big boy with his boots on. The argument is irrelevant because Yeshua already celebrated the other minor holy days, and we have that in proof, in writing, in John chapter 10, because of Hanukkah. Minor doesn't mean you don't celebrate it. Minor means that it's not as long as the major holidays in their book references. The Gospel of John is a road map of Yeshua walking through the biblical holy days from the Sabbath all the way to the resurrection. The only biblical festival that makes any sense is Purim in the year 28. The Feast of John 5 fell on the Sabbath. We know that. We have that in writing. The only feast day to fall on the Sabbath between CE 25 and CE 35 was Purim on CE 28. So, history, mathematics, common sense shows us that the healing that took place at Beth Hasidah took place on Purim, the giving of gifts. The Spirit of God intentionally left out the yod vav from this feast because God was deliberately left out of the book of Esther. In John 5, Yeshua healed a man who had been infirm for 38 years. How long did they wander in the wilderness? After striking the rock, 38 years. Near the pool of Beth Hasidim, John 5, 1 through 9. It's also the first time in his public ministry that he declared that God and his Father are equal as one. John 5, 18. He also said the Son of God and the Son of Man was one. This chapter is absolutely highly critical in presenting Yeshua as deity. Now, did Yeshua get dressed up in a poor uniform and stomp his feet and ring the gogger? And did he observe the commandment to give food to the poor? I'm sure that he attended one of the what we believe to be 480 synagogues that were in Jerusalem at the time, <coughs> did he stomp his feet and scream about Mordecai and Haman? I don't know. I don't think that's what they did. I think that's all modern stuff. Mm -hmm. Yet I'm sure he contemplated the message of the book of Esther. And the theme of the book was God's preservation of the Hebrew people and the celebration of the events of Purim. And it took place 
at this pool of Bethesda. Now, in some English translations, not all of them, it says that an angel of the Lord came down and stirred the waters. But the manuscripts we have from the year 200 just say the angel, the messenger. We know that this pool was a Greek healing pool dedicated to the Greek god of healing, Asiphilus. Those people that were there were there as worshipers of the Greek gods on Mount Olympus, and they were there pleading for Asiphilus, the Greek god of healing, to heal them when the water was stirred. Do you want to be healed? Was the question that Yeshua asked the lame man. Have you ever noticed there's no answer? Well, I have no one to put me in the water. But there's no answer whether or not you want to be healed. We have a confrontation in front of all of those people. It's not done in the vacuum. In front of all those people, we have a confrontation with the syphilis and Yeshua. We have two gods in a challenge. Do you want to be healed? Yeshua, I have no one to put me in the water. A syphilis. Yeshua, you don't need the water. You don't need the Greek God. You don't need all those things. You need take up your bed and walk. In front of all those people, we had a confrontation between the evil gods of this world and the true one living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yeshua the Messiah. At the pool of the now, let me tell you something exciting that happened to me. I, I, I guess it's a little egotistical, but it's it was it was exciting. Not last October, but the October before that, we were at the Pool of Bethesda, and I taught that lesson to a very experienced, knowledgeable Israeli tour guide. And he made my day. He said, I've never heard anything like that before. And I said, well, I don't know if I said it out loud or not. I said, well, you have now. You heard it now. Because that's what this is all about. I mean, we were standing, looking down. Church of St. Anne is right here. And we're looking down at the pool of Bethesda that's still there. And we were discussing the confrontation between Yeshua and Asiphilus, the Greek God of healing. The Lord himself took advantage of the feast of Purim to teach his students, his Talmudim, about himself and about the commandment to give gifts to the poor. John tells us that by the sheep gates is a place called Bethesda, the place of healing, the place of comfort, the place of mercy. Bet Hasidim, meaning house of mercy. The two words are given the distinct impression that there was a house or a temple, which there was, where merciful acts were carried out. Archaeological excavations in the area of St. Anne's Church north of the Temple Mount have demonstrated that there were a healing shrine to the Greek god of healing, a syphilis. Now don't get frustrated by St. Anne's church. First of all, St. Anne was never there. <laughs> Helena listened to archaeological evidence. Helena was Constantine's mother. 
and she named it St. Anne. Anne was supposed to be the sister of Mary, Mary who gave birth to the Messiah. <coughs> they never claimed at the church that's where it happened. The claim was this church is built as a commemoration to this pool where it did happen. <coughs> so don't be angry with the church. If the church would not have been there, I believe, the Muslims, starting with the conquest in 1299, the Muslims would have, as they did most of the other, devastated all of the Christian holy places. There was a healing shrine to the Greek god Asiprus. In the shadow of this, right at the foot of this shrine, there was a sick man, a lame man, who'd been lying on his bed for 38 years. 38 years. The Messiah, Yeshua, approached him to offer him a Purim gift, a gift of good health. He said, do you want to be healed? Now, he responded in the affirmative, but he never said he wanted to be healed. But he added that, I have nobody to put me in the pool. He's still talking about being put in the pool for a syphilis. you got a confrontation. My God, your, your God, your God, my God. Do you want to be healed? Well, sure I want to be healed, but I have nobody to take me to a syphilis. I'm reading between the lines. You sure said that's not what you need, son. This is what you need. How much you need. The Messiah is what you need. Take up your bed and walk. Get up. Yeshua said to him, Rise, <clears throat> take up your bed and walk. The man anticipated and accepted the gift, and he was instantly healed. He walked home. This is very significant in the real Purim story because <clears throat> the Hebrews of Susa were probably worshiping the Babylonian and Persian deities, Isaiah 46, 1 through 7, including what came next was Eshtar, the Babylonian worship of fertility. They were probably worshiping <clears throat> the Babylonian and Persian deities. Baal or Bel. It's another name for Marduk. Mordecai's name comes from the pagan deity Marduk. Esther, even though she had a Hebrew name, her Hebrew name is Hadassah, her Hebrew name was not used, her Persian name was used because it was the same as the goddess Ishtar. Ishtar. There are many good Bible-believing Bible teaching, spirit filled, God blessing people who tell me that I'm wrong about Easter coming from Eshdar, but I'm not wrong. That's exactly where it came from. It came from the Eshdar sacrifice. That's where the egg came from. That's where the fertility rites came from. That's where you have the bunny and the egg in the Easter celebration. And Instead of using Hadassah, Mordecai and Esther were so ingrained into Babylonian society that they used their Babylonian names. In John chapter 5, the sick man was a picture of the nation of Israel. 38 years. Wandering in the wilderness. They had a decision to make. Would they trust 
Yeshua and be healed and their sins forgiven. The religious leaders, the denominational leaders, on the other hand, rebuked the man for carrying his bed on the Sabbath. Rather than celebrating his healing, they rebuked him for the man-made rules and regulations <coughs> that had come into play. <clears throat> that rebuke was not of the Lord. They could not rejoice. They could not laugh. They could not exchange gifts. They could not be happy that this man was healed. What kind of attitude is that? Yeshua pointed out to the man that he'd had an infirmity because of sin in his life, and he warned him that worse things would come upon him if he continued in his way. In other words, he had to get saved. He had to have the Adamic nature forgiven and his walk, his halakha, changed. Israel had gone into the Babylonian captivity because of their sins, Second Chronicles 36, Leviticus 26, and the only way that they came out was to repent. On Purim, we're instructed as believers to give gifts to the poor. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean poor in their pocket, that they only got 10 cents in their pocket. It means that we're to give gifts to those that are spiritually poor by supporting those that are spiritually wealthy that we can bring them the greatest gift, and that is the Messiah. These are picture words. These are phrases. This is teaching you to support ministry. Yeshua gave this gift to the poor sick man. <clears throat> what great poor presence to receive. Yeshua had a conversation with a Samaritan woman by the well in Sidon. In this conversation, he described the gift of God as everlasting life, John 4. The Messiah offered this man in Bethesda as a Greek God of healing at the shrine to a syphilis more than the gift of physical healing. He offered him the gift of eternal life. I told you I'd be going a little over this morning, so just hold on. Hold on. Let me see. I, I think I lost my place. Here we go. I'm good. <clears throat> Rabbi Saul of Tarsus spoke about the giving in another context. When he said, you know that the grace of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, that thought he was rich, and yet he, for your sakes, was poor. <coughs> you thought his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8. He goes on to describe the Messiah as an indescribable gift. Without Messiah, we're poor. It's not the change in your pocket. It's the change in your heart. Without Messiah, we're poor. We have accepted God's poor gift of salvation, which gives us the blessing and the richness of eternal life his beloved son the most important decision that you will ever have to make is to know Yeshua as your personal savior that is the gift that is Purim that's the gospel message that's the truth of Torah and that's what Purim is all about it's Yeshua in Purim and that's the lesson that I wanted to share with you this morning not the grockers, not the noise, not the food, not the fun, not the fellowship. Well, I want all that. Somebody asked me, I forgot what day it was, Sunday. Somebody asked me, well, are you anti-Palestinian? I said, no, ma'am, I'm not. I'm not anti-anything. I'm pro-Jesus. I was talking in the church. And so, uh, First Baptist in whatever town we were in, 
And I said, I'm pro, so I used her vocabulary. I'm pro Jesus. I'm pro Yeshua. I'm not opposed to all of these other things about poor, but the key is our Savior and our Lord that needs to be in our heart the gift of eternal life for the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. So, class, that's Yeshua and Purim. Thank you for letting me take